Shalom and thank you for joining us. To those who I have not yet had the pleasure to meet, my name is Jeremy Weiss, and I am a director at the Yad Vashem International Relations Division. The Yad Vashem Museum has been closed due to the world pandemic. We are confident that we will open in the near future, but until then, we have organized a virtual tour of the museum. The Yad Vashem Museum is more than a museum. It is a monument to the Holocaust victims and survivors, and it is an educational center. I would like to introduce you to my dear colleague, Lori Gerson. Lori was born in the US and graduated from Barnard College in New York. Lori worked for many years in the field of education in the US before making Aliyah with her family. She joined Yad Vashem six years ago and currently holds the position at Yad Vashem International School for Holocaust Education. Thank you very much and I enjoy the tour. Thank you everyone for joining us today. I can say this is the biggest group I've ever guided and certainly the most international as well. So we're really pleased to have you all here today. And it goes without saying that we wish we could be doing this in person, but uh, we are, so to speak, taking the melons that we've been given in the world we live today and we're making lemonade out of that. And we are for the first time ever welcoming you to our museum from the comfort of your home. So we're really pleased to have you here. Um, and I will be your guide in the museum. Now, I also want to let you know that in here, I'm going to start this, you can see around you as I speak, um, that today's tour, I'm calling a behind the scenes tour of Yad Vashem. And the reason why I'm calling it that is because our focus today, when we go into the museum, we'll be looking at what we have in the museum, why we chose to put that in there, and also how we use the museum and the exhibit to express what we want to give over to all of you. Okay, so um, that's why I'm calling it the behind the scenes tour. Now, whenever I have visitors to Yad Vashem, the first thing I always do is I talk about the name of the place that we're at. I assume a lot of you out there don't understand Hebrew and the name Yad Vashem is in Hebrew. Okay, so um, I will first translate the words for you. Yad Vashem means a memorial and a name. So why do we call the place where we have memorialized the 6 million Jews that were killed in the Holocaust and we try to tell the story of what happened to all the Jews in the Holocaust? Why do we call it a memorial and a name? Because there's one thing that we do know at Yad Vashem, we know that that number is a number that we really cannot comprehend. We can't comprehend anything in 6 million, let alone that many people being murdered. So one of the things that we really try to do here at Yad Vashem is we try to give back the names and the stories to the victims and thereby better understand what happened to the Jews in the Holocaust, okay? So we're certainly gonna do that today as we uh, go on our tour of Yad Vashem. So with that, I'm gonna bring you around over here. You can see the beautiful view of Jerusalem. This is the museum in front of you right now. You see that um, and you see this overhang over here. We're going to go into that area first as the beginning of the museum. Notice that as we walk into the museum, or the, the, I hope you can see uh, on the screen that the, we're on a bridge and the bridge does not go straight across. The bridge slopes downward. And I think that's very symbolic because we're about to go into a place where man got as low as man could get in his treatment toward fellow human beings. And we're going to see that that symbolism is carried through the museum. Okay, so I want you to take note of that. And now we're going to go into the museum and we walk in. And first you see the expanse of the museum over here. We're going to get to that in a few minutes. But I do want to show you this room over here. What's interesting, this is the first room that everybody comes to when they come to Yad Vashem. So I'm taking you here today. And you'll notice that we really don't see anything. You see lights, you see the walls, uh, but here I'm going to take you to what everybody what we see when we walk in to this area. And you see that there was a screen there, and this is the movie that's playing on the screen as we walk into the museum and you come in today. Now, what we're seeing here, it's, it's a movie, but it's really a montage. What do we mean by a montage? What we see here are pictures, images, and video clips put together. And we call this the living landscape. It was done by an artist. Her name is Michal Rovner. Why do we call it the living landscape? It's because what we're seeing here are Jews living in Europe before the war. Jews living there in the 1920s and 30s. Now, why did Yad Vashem, when they're starting to tell the story of what happened to the Jews in the Holocaust, why did they start with this? And maybe not where the Holocaust started, with the rise of Hitler. 
So there's a few reasons. The first reason I want to share with you is that Yad Vashem felt that to understand the magnitude of what we lost in the Holocaust, we have to see what we had before. If I wanted to show you what we lost in the Holocaust, the truth is I really could have done that with charts and graphs as well. I could have showed you a chart and said there were X amount of Jews in Poland before the war and only Y amount survived. And the same thing, like in Romania, there were X amount of Jews before the war and only Y amount survived and so on and so forth. But that's just numbers, right? So here we think it's a lot more effective. You can see the Jews and how they were living in Europe before the war. And we express the same thing, but in a much more personal way. The other reason why we start with this living landscape, and when people come to Yad Vashem, I get these questions all the time. So I know that people are thinking this. They're wondering, why didn't the Jews see it coming? How could they not see the writing on the wall? Why didn't they get out sooner? And I think as we sit and watch this living landscape, we begin to understand how the Jews didn't see it coming. That we just saw before were images. You see, there's images that we see. There's a map superimposed. We saw images in pastoral villages. Those in Yiddish, we call those the shtetls, which translates to towns. And in Eastern Europe, the Jews, a lot of the Jews lived in those shtetls. And now we're moving into scenes where some of the Jews lived in the cities. We saw very traditional looking Jews. We saw some also more secular looking Jews. And we're certainly going to see that as we move into the next part of this living landscape. Now, going back to what I said before, right, when we see the Jews living in Europe before the war, we begin to a little bit better understand how they did, didn't see it coming. Why? Because we're seeing them in their lives. We're seeing them. We saw little boys outside with their rabbi. They were standing outside. We see now we're going to see other Jews and the lives that they led. And we're going to see that not only do we have a variety of different Jews that lived all throughout Europe, we're going to see that. We're going to see how they lived. We're going to see the stores that they owned, the languages they spoke. We're going to see how they dressed. Sometimes they dressed traditional, very obvious that they're Jewish. Sometimes they dressed uh, more so they would blend in with their non-Jewish neighbors. And I'm going to go out of the movie for one second, okay, out of this living landscape. I'm going to take you back in the museum. And I told you that there's nothing in this area, but I do want to show you one thing that we do have, and it's very subtle. Look what we're standing on is you're standing with me in this area. I don't know if you can see what that is. I'm gonna zoom in a little bit. We're standing on carpet. And what kind of feeling do we get from carpet, right? And the answers I always get, we get a warm feeling, we get a soft feeling, it's comfortable, and we get what we call a homey feeling. And I think that's the message that Yad Vashem wanted to send here. In the beginning of the museum, as we're watching, I'm gonna put the video back on so you can see it. Um, there it is. As we're watching this living landscape, the message is we have to understand that the Jews during this time, before the Holocaust starts, they're very much at home in Europe. We're moving in here. Now you see uh, over here, excuse me, we have the, we have Zionist Jews dancing in the street. Notice they're dancing in the street. They are not afraid to be outside showing off their Zionist passion. And we're going to see that one more time. So that's important to take note. Okay. And we also have them. Ooh, sorry about that. We have them right next to the religious Jews. So we see lots of different kinds of Jews together. And now I want you to listen for a minute. We're going to hear something very special. And in fact, I'll turn the volume up a little bit. Now, I know that not all of you recognize that song, but maybe some of you do. It's Hebrew, and it's the Hatikva. And what it is, is it's Israel's national anthem. Now, these school children, this, this clip comes from Munkach, Hungary in 1933. So obviously, there wasn't a state of Israel then. So what are they singing? At that time, it is the Zionist anthem. And again, look at where these hundreds of Jewish children are standing and singing. They are outside, not afraid to be showing off their Zionist passion. So I want everybody to see that. And the last reason why we start, that I want to share with you today, that why we start with this living landscape in the beginning of the museum, is because unfortunately, after we leave this area of the museum, when we go throughout the story, from that time on, we will only see the Jews as victims. 
And it's very important to Yad Vashem that all of our visitors, like you are today, that all of our visitors that come, they understand that these Jews, they were real people. Um, they came into the world not as victims. They came as people that had, like we said before, they had jobs and families and hobbies and political thoughts um, and all those sorts of things. So I wanted to share that with you. And now we are going to go back. We're going to go to the museum and continue on with our tour now that we understand that. Okay. There we are. Now, notice as we turn around and we're gonna walk into the museum, I hope you can see from here, I'll show you from another angle too, we're continuing to walk downwards, right? We talked about that symbolism. We're going to a place where man got as low as man could get in his treatment toward fellow human beings. And we come right here, and I just wanna turn around for a minute because actually I think the sloping there, it's a little more obvious, but I also wanna point something out. We just stepped off of the carpeted area. So that gives us a hint that something's gonna change and it definitely does unfortunately. So we come here to our first display in the museum that I have to tell you is the only uh, display in the museum that's not in chronological order. The rest of the museum does go in order of how the events took place during the Holocaust. But here we have an event or something that happens very much towards the end of the war. So it begs the question, why do the people who were designing the museum, why did they take it out of order and put it here? Must, there must be a reason. So first we have to examine what we're looking at here and then we can hopefully answer that question. What we're gonna do is we're gonna look, you see we have two big pictures in the background. Notice also we have something in the front. Okay, and we're gonna take a look at both of those things in a minute. I'm gonna zoom in and I know it's, we're looking from an angle over here and I'm actually kind of happy. It's a difficult picture to look at. Clearly what we're seeing here and I'm, I think you can see, we're seeing some sort of mass grave. We're seeing bodies. And what are the bodies piled up with? They're piled up with wood. Can you see where you see those logs? Now, why are they piling the bodies up with wood? Obviously they're planning on burning the bodies. And why are they burning the bodies? They want to get rid of the evidence. I'm going to pause here for one second and go out of history for a little bit. And I just want to talk about as we move further and further away from the time of the Holocaust, we know that there are people who are trying to deny that the Holocaust ever happened, right? Holocaust deniers. Deny it happened or to deny the facts, the extent of it. It's important to understand the origins of that. Who were the first deniers of the Holocaust? It was the Nazis themselves. We see it very clearly here. They're trying to get rid of the evidence. Now, where is this is take, taking place? And I'll explain to you who the people in the background are in a minute, so just be patient. Um, these pictures come from a work camp called Kluge. Kluge was in a country called Estonia, which is the northernmost, the north, most northern Baltic country, the Baltic states up there. And um, there were roughly anywhere from two to 3,000 prisoners in this work camp of Kluge. And they were almost all Jewish. There were just 100 uh, Soviet prisoners of war, but the rest of them were Jewish. We also know that the Jews who were in this work camp, they were from mostly from the, uh, the Vilna ghetto and a very few also from the Kovno ghetto. And both of those cities are in Lithuania and here we're in Estonia and the Germans always moved people around and they displaced them. Okay, so we have that, that's where they're from. Now, um, we know that we see that there was a mass murder and it, most of the prisoners were killed. So the, um, the, oh, there were about 80 prisoners that were able to escape. And from them, we know the story of what happened. So let me tell you what happened in Kluge, because we're going to talk about it as we go along. Now, in this work camp, these pictures come from September of 1944. This mass murder started taking place on September 19th of 1944. So like we said, very much towards the end of the war. What I also want to just remind people is many times we think of World War II, we think, okay, it began in September of 1939 and it ended in May of 1945. But we have to remember that there are dynamics here with the war where it's starting in different places at different times and different places that are being liberated in different times. So what's happening in this area now is the allies are getting closer. And the Jews in the camp, they even know that from the Estonian guards who are working with the Nazis. So they let them in on the fact that the front is getting closer to them. They start hearing bombs in the background. And what they, the Nazis start doing is the week before this massacre begins, they, they let the Jews stop working. They, it's a labor camp. They've been doing backbreaking work for them for years. And they stop all of the labor. And not only that, they start to give them better food. Now, why is that significant? 
because the Jews could have been worried that with the uh, allies getting close that the Nazis wanted to kill them. But instead, because they're getting better food, especially, they think, well, why would the not they, they never give us food? We're, we're, in, we're in starvation ration, rations here. Why are they giving us food now? And so the Jews begin to believe that they are being moved from one labor camp to another, and they've been moved all throughout the war. So it's very believable to them. Okay, so we see this deception, and I just want everybody to, to understand that. Now, what happens, unfortunately, on September 19th, the Jews are, they're, they're called to the middle. They're given actually the best soup they've ever had. They, they actually say that in the testimonies. And they're told to sit down and it's a sunny day. And at one o'clock in the afternoon, everything changes. And the Estonians and the Nazis start surrounding the camp and they start taking groups of Jews out and they can hear the shootings taking place. So that's what happens. And we do have a few of the Jews who are able to escape. Now, we do see from this picture that the allies, those are the Soviet soldiers, they get to Kluga, unfortunately not in time to save the lives of most of the Jews, but they do get there in time to save the bodies. Some, some of the bodies were burned, but a lot of them weren't yet. And you might be thinking to yourself, well, I mean, that's really not such a big deal. The Jews were already killed. And it is sad. We really wish they could have gotten there in time. But if anybody's familiar with the story of the Holocaust, it, we, and I tell you, you'll understand it really is a big deal. Why? Because the story of the Holocaust isn't the murder of the Jews, but it's also the mass murder of the Jews, the, the, industri the industrial murder of the Jews. And millions of Jews were killed in gas chambers and their bodies were cremated or they were shot in the shooting pits and they're buried in mass graves. And so here, right, and when, when that happens, there's nothing left from the Jews. Everything's taken away from them before they're killed and there's nothing left. And sometimes we even refer to it as the double tragedy. And why do we call it that? Because it's bad enough that the Nazis wanted to kill us, right, the Jews, but they also wanted to erase all memory of them. So here in this case, um, they do manage to find the bodies before they're burnt, some of them. And when they find the bodies, guess what else they also find? They find the items that the Jews had in their pockets. And through what the Jews had in their pockets, we were then able to uh, learn throughout the years who, years who some of these Jews were. First of all, I just want to point out to you, sadly, the, and sadly, if you think about it, it is a very fascinating case study in human nature to see what it is people have on them when they're finally reduced to what they can only hold in their pockets. So what do you think they found? And you know what? I'm going to jump out here for a minute because I want you to see a little more closely. Here we have a picture of the display and you see that we have the big picture in back, right? And very much it's the background to the story. It's the historical context. We have to give that. But what do we have in front? What do we put right up front and center? We have the items they found. And I don't know if you can tell from this picture, you can even see here, what did they find? First and foremost, well, they found photographs. They found pictures. Who did, and, and, and who's in these pictures? We can imagine that it's their family, it's their friends. Uh, sometimes they even take pictures of themselves, right? And I want to show you this by way of example. I think that this is beautiful. We have here, this is a picture of a rabbi who was a teacher and three of his beloved students. And this is what was written on the back of the picture. And I call them his beloved students because what did they write on the back of the picture? They wrote a poem to him about what a fabulous teacher he was. And imagine this teacher, and we know from so many survivor counts and many times the Jews when they're being, uh, um, and they're being taken from their homes. They're given sometimes 15, 20, 30 minutes only to pack up and report to the train station or pack up and report to the center of town. And we think of those moments. And here we have a teacher that the tribute his, his students gave to him means so much to him that that's one of the last things he takes with him when he leaves his house. So it's probably, yes, family, friends, but also anybody who's important to them. And now we go back to here. And what else did they find in the pockets? Well, you can see from the display over here, the, sorry, the glass display that they found documents. And what kind of documents they find? Probably the ones you're thinking of in your head right now. They found birth, birth certificates and marriage certificates. You know what they found a lot of? They found a lot of um, uh, de degrees and diplomas and work cards, work, work cards. Now, why, did, why do you think the Jews took took those. Well, first of all, from the emotional point of view, that's 
who they are. Many of us define or partly define who we are by what we do. It's what we work our whole life for. So it really speaks to them about who they are. It's part of their identity. But I think we also have to consider the practical, what's the practical implications of what's going on here. They're leaving their homes. They don't know where they're being taken to. It's wartime. Wherever somebody goes, what do they have to do for their family? They have to provide. They have to show that they have a skill that they can do or something that they're good at. So I think for both of those reasons, we found a lot of these degrees and diplomas and work cards. And now that we know all of that, we can go back and answer the question we originally asked. Why was this display taken out of order and put here in the beginning of the museum? It's just like we said outside. We have this huge collected number of 6 million Jews that were killed in the Holocaust. And here's one of the very few places where we can give back the names and the stories to the victims based on what we found in their pockets. So I'm gonna, with that spirit in mind, I wanna share with you a story or two before we leave this area. Now, you see this picture here. Uh, this, man, this man is Yaakov, Yaakov Noach Lev. The picture was found in his pocket. He was the one who was killed in Kluga. And this woman over here is Lucia Pinchuk Shimmel. And she also went through the Holocaust, but she ended up surviving. And the story of how um, this picture was discovered is, is fascinating. Lucia had a friend, and his name was Hillel Zeidel. He was in Kluga. And in 1967, Hillel Zeidel goes to Estonia, and in Estonia, they had a, a display of the photographs that were found in Kluga, and he sees Lucia there. He sees that photograph and he's a, he's a friend of hers. So he, he goes to the authorities there and he asks them for a copy of the picture and they give it to him. And he brings it back to Israel to show it to Lucia. And she is in shock when she sees the picture. Why is she in shock? Well, there's two reasons. First of all, she didn't remember anybody taking the picture. So she's shocked that it didn't even exist. And then she tells us a story of when the picture was taken and then you'll understand when and why and you'll, you'll understand in a minute. So what does she say? That this picture was taken in 1937. So we're really talking the, right before the war starts. They're in their late teens and both of their families were at the same vacation resort outside of Vilna for the summer. And they had been previously introduced by a mutual friend. And we can understand we have a young Jewish man, a young Jewish woman, they're in nature for the summer. And she tells us, what do they do? They go boating and they go hiking. And if you look at the picture here, you see she's got a pen in her hand and a pad. They're doing a crossword puzzle. And she remembers doing that crossword puzzle with them. She doesn't remember the picture being taken, but she remembers doing the crossword puzzle. But then she tells us, she said, you know, I really, we were just friends. We were friends, but what does even Lucia realize for the first time, literally decades later, when she discovers that this is one of the last pictures that Yaakov took with him when he left his house? You know, I'm going to quote her, and this is what she says. She says to her, it's a silent testimony of feelings that could have been, but now never will be. And that's what she says, right? She realizes that maybe <laughs> he liked her a little more than she thought. Now, there's a new part of the story that I'm gonna share with you. And when I say new, I mean really brand new. And what's that? That just recently I had the pleasure of being able to speak over the phone to Yaakov's nephew. Yaakov ne Yaakov's nephew lives in St. Louis, Missouri. And I was able to talk to him. And I was thinking maybe he could give me a little more information than we already had. And it actually was quite the opposite. What does that mean? They, he, he didn't know anything about his uncle. Um, it was the opposite. And why was it the opposite? Why is there a black hole? And the reason why is because his father was the only survivor of his family from the Holocaust. And he was so traumatized by what happened that he could never talk about it. He could never talk about it. We hear that very often. And so um, he vaguely remembered the nephew vaguely remembered, or he pieced together that there were a number of siblings, but the only name he ever heard from his father was Yaakov. And why was he the only sibling he knew? And I'm going to show you that right here. And we have here this collection from Yaakov Lev. You see that there. So there were pictures found in his pocket, but also I want you to see this document. This is a transcript. And what we found out is this is part of the transcript that allowed him to be accepted into medical school. Now, um, in terms of the story with the nephew, 
So why did he always know just that one brother Yaakov? Because the one thing his father did share with him was the pride he felt that his brother had gotten into medical school. And not only that, that it would mean a lot for him if his son could go into the to medical school and to pick a profession in the medical field to carry on that legacy. And sure enough, uh, the nephew goes by Judel, he, he did become a dentist. And he did that a lot because that's what his father wanted him to do, he told me, and because he felt that he could continue the legacy of this one uncle that he had heard about. Now, I also want to add that when we look at these items and we see them, we think to ourselves, well, the people who had them on them, this, this is their past. These were their lives. It's everything that they had accomplished up until then. But we see also, it can be, from what we see here with uh, Yaakov, it's also sometimes their future, right? This was his plan for the future. He's going to go to medical school. He had a picture of the girl, uh, the young woman that he had a crush on, possibly he had hopes of marrying her one day. So very much what was found in Yaakov's pocket is a reflection of what was, but also a reflection of what he was hoping could be. So that ends our story with Yaakov. And I want to share with you one other story from this area. And I want to introduce you to Shabtai Blacher. Shabtai Blacher, you see him here. He's this, this person right here. Now, it looks like he's maybe monkeying around with his friends, but really we see from the other items that we found in his pocket, you can see here, the Union of Artists of the Jewish Theaters in Poland. He was an actor. And that's what he's doing in the picture. It's, it's a scene from a play that he's in. Now, what do we know about Shabtai from the survivors who are in Kluga? And this is very fascinating. Once, one Sunday a month, for some reason, the Nazis gave the Jews in Kluga a day off. Okay, so they had the day off every one, one Sunday in every month. Now, we would think to ourselves, they're doing backbreaking work for the rest of the month. They're being fed starvation rations right? And there's disease also all over. So what would we think that they would do on their one day off? We would think they would literally just collapse. They would just rest the whole day. What did Shabtai do? Shabtai would entertain his friends. He would organize singing. He would order, organize literary circles. And what does that show us? Why do I share that story with you? So, well, let me put it to you this way. When we work at Yad Vashem, many times people will ask us, and they'll say, well, you work at Yad Vashem, it must be so depressing. And the truth is, is that if I wasn't affected by what I heard, what I learned, or what I talked about and read, then I shouldn't be working at Yad Vashem. So it is difficult sometimes. But what we really like to focus on at Yad Vashem and where we think the real lessons lie in learning about the Holocaust is not how the Jews died, but how they lived with everything that was happening to them even if it was just for short, a short time, how they struggled, how they coped, how they sometimes overcame, sometimes they didn't overcome. Okay, and we feel that seeing how they've lived is where the lessons really lie. And we see that very much with Shabtai that um, when he had the, the only opportunity he had, he used that to be who he was. And I could say it simply like this. I could say that, we see his effort to maintain his humanity when it was constantly being taken away from him. Okay, so we're gonna see that more as we go through the museum. So now we're gonna go back to the museum and we're gonna just take a minute to stand over here and take a look across the museum itself. And we're gonna talk a little bit about the design of the building, the architecture, we're doing it because there's a lot of meaning there. And there's a lot of meaning there because Moshe Safdi, who was the architect, he very much worked hand in hand with the people from, the, from Yad Vashem when they were designing the exhibit. It's a very deliberate building. He wanted to use the building to help Yad Vashem get across its, its message. Okay, so that's why we're gonna talk about the building today. Now, um, when you look across the museum, you can see first of all that we're, we're, it, it's just, it's all concrete, right? Very prison-like. Um, so we get that feeling. And the other thing that uh, most visitors um, say that when they look across the museum, they get a feeling of being claustrophobic. Why do they feel claustrophobic? Because you can see that we have this triangular shape and it feels like the walls are closing in on them. And also, I don't know if you can see in the distance, the museum does get a little more narrow as we 
continue on. So there definitely is this feeling of being closed in. And the other thing I want to point out to you is that if you look across the museum, you'll notice we can't really see into any of the galleries at all. And I think that's very symbolic of what happened to the Jews in the Holocaust. They did not know what was happening and they could not see into the future. And we have to keep in mind, we examine the Holocaust, but we live in a world where a Holocaust has happened. And these Jews lived in a world where a Holocaust could not have happened or hadn't happened yet. And yes, the Jews went through rough times, but they had never been through anything like this. So um, the museum certainly gives across that message. And I also want to show you this. I'm going to turn here and show you how we enter one of the galleries. We go in over here, we come around, and we exit over here. And then once we come to this middle area, then we exit. We, we enter the next exit, and we come around over here, and we exit again. And the same thing, so on and so forth. Now, why am I showing you that? Because I want you to understand that every time we're in one gallery, we can't see into the next one until we get there. And again, I think that's a very symbolic of what happened to the Jews in the Holocaust. That as bad as things were getting, every time something happened along the way, they never could have anticipated how horrible the next stage would be. And again, that's because nothing like this had ever happened before in history to anybody. Okay, and if I could, I'm going to quote my friend's father, he, Jack Kaplansky, survivor of the Holocaust, and he wrote his memoirs down, not in a book, he wrote them in an email that I have, and he and his brother as teenagers found themselves alone in the Lodge ghetto, and what I mean by alone is the rest of the family was taken away. And they're struggling in the Lodge ghetto, and what do they do after a little bit of time, he tells us? They volunteer to go to Auschwitz. Think about that. They get on a train willingly to go to Auschwitz. Now, why do they do that? As he says in the book, rightfully so for them at the time, they thought to themselves, nothing could be worse than Loj. So what do they do? They volunteer. And how does he start his next chapter? He says, and then we found that something could be worse. Okay, so that just gives you an idea of how the Jews really didn't couldn't understand what was happening to them. Also, you'll notice that we have barriers all along the way. You cannot take, oops, sorry, you cannot take a shortcut through the museum. You can only go on that zigzag path that I showed you that was given to you by the people that designed the museum. And again, I think that's very symbolic of what happened to the Jews in the Holocaust. Sometimes we look back and we think, well, they should have made different choices. They should have run to the forest. They should have fought back. They should have gotten together. We, uh, we come up maybe with all these things that they should have done. But when we study the Holocaust in depth, what we begin to understand is they really had no choices. And they had no choices because, like we saw before in Kluga, everything that was done to them was meant to deceive them, ultimately with the goal of killing them. Okay, so we see that right here in the design, we can only go on one path, just like the Jews could really only go on the path that was given to them by the Nazis. And with that, I'm going to take you now to the gallery that we're going to examine today. We're going to go into the area of Theresienstadt. Now, Theresienstadt was a ghetto. It was also a camp. It had characteristics of both, so you'll hear it um, being called both of them. But we're going to start with this map. So first of all, we've seen, we've seen videos, we've seen photographs, we've seen documents, we've seen architecture, and all of these things help us with our message here in the museum. Now we're going to look at the map. And what you see in this map, first of all, just ignore these big black squares. They're just movie screens that aren't working right now. But you see these little red boxes. And so those are ghettos. It's not all the ghettos because there were over a thousand ghettos that the Germans set up, but it is the bigger ghettos. We have this on the, we have them on this map. And when you look at the map, there is one thing that we notice. And that is that all of the ghettos we see, right? All the ghettos, they're all in Eastern Europe. And that's what the Germans did. They put ghettos in Eastern Europe. But if we look over here in Western Europe, we only see one. And they didn't have any ghettos in Western Europe except for Theresienstadt. So that gives us a hint that Theresienstadt has a unique status. And it does in many ways, but one of the most well-known um, 
unique features of Theresienstadt was its use as a propaganda tool by the Nazis. So a lot of people know the story that in June of 1944, the Red Cross came to visit Theresienstadt. And the Germans had spent a lot of time improving the conditions and uh, making it look like a wonderful city that Hitler was providing for the Jews. And in fact, this visit was so successful that the Germans created a movie after that that they were, they were planning on releasing. But what a lot of people don't realize is that even earlier on, Theresienstadt was used by the Germans for propaganda purposes and how so, being that it was in Western Europe, that when they decided to deport the Jews out of Germany and out of Austria, for example, what was, what was their story? They were telling people they were taking the Jews away for labor. But what was the problem? They had a lot of elderly people they had 75 year olds, 80 year olds. So to say that you're taking them, those people away for labor doesn't really hold water. And on top of that, in these places in Germany and Austria, there really were some Jews that one could call had somewhat of a celebrity status. They were well known artists, they were well known musicians, academics. And they were afraid that if they started taking those people away, that people would start asking questions. So what did they actually call to Ravenstadt? They began to call it a spa town. And they, they even had some of the elderly people sign contracts and pay money for better accommodations. You see the extent of the deception. Okay, so that was one of the special, the unique things about um, the ghetto of Theresienstadt. The other thing that we use in the museum to help tell the story is plain and simple. We have plaques that explain things. But I want to show you this plaque in particular and see what we can learn from it. It says in January 1942, so the ghetto was established in November of 1941. That's when it opened. In January of 1942, shortly after the establishment of the Theresien ghetto, the deportation to death began. The people in the ghetto lived in constant fear of being sent to the east. About 88,000 of the ghetto's Jews were sent to extermination camps of whom uh, 4,157 are known to, sur to have survived. So first of all, what we see here, and this is why we sometimes call to raise in stat also a camp, but it very much had the characteristics of a transit camp, meaning people came and people were taken away. But notice, we, just, we don't just tell you the history and the facts, but we see this, oops, sorry about that, see this line over here? the people in the ghetto lived in constant fear of being sent to the East. So not only do we learn what happened to the Jews, we learn how it affected them. Okay, so that's important when we tell the story of Theresienstadt. Now, one of the things that is also different about Theresienstadt as opposed to all the other, oops, sorry, I meant to go over here, as opposed to all the other ghettos was that in the other ghettos um, and all the other ones, the Jews lived in family units and granted, they could be very, very crowded sometimes, multiple families, and in, in many times, multiple families in one unit, but they did live as families. And in Theresienstadt, they separated the men and women. And so in the beginning, the boys went with their fathers and the girls went with their mothers. But after a few months, the Jewish council that was in Theresienstadt um, and also that makes it like a ghetto instead of like a camp. So it had both of those features. I'm just pointing that out. You'll probably hear both, but I just want to point that out. They made a decision and they decided that they were going to take the children out of those, um, of the places where the adults were living. And also to raise that it was a big fortress city. We'll see, you know what, I'm going to show you that uh, right now as we click on this Monopoly board that we see here. You see, right, here's a picture of the ghetto on the Monopoly board drawn in, and it's this, this fortress town that the Germans took over to give it as a ghetto to the Jews. And just so we have an understanding of how horrible the conditions were, the ghetto was meant to house, house 7,000 Jews, 7,000 people. The height of the ghetto, there were over 58,000 Jews living in this area. Okay, so the conditions were really very, very difficult. In fact, they were difficult on purpose because the Germans wanted the people to die off from the conditions. 
Now they took the, the, the men and the women, they were living in these big kind of dormitories, 80 to 100 people per room, and they took the children out. They took the children out because their hope was to make things better for the children. It really was a gesture on their part to form camaraderie with the children so they could have possibly have child experiences in the ghetto, but also um, maybe give them better, uh, more food if they could to make things better for them. And here we see a game that was made by one of the adults, Oswald Pauk. He was in the graphics department. So here we see an artifact and we're gonna show how it uh, helps us understand what happened in the Holocaust. He makes this Monopoly game for the children. And first of all, when we talk about games for children, we play them. And, but really, when we think about playing games with younger children, especially, board games like this really, deep down inside, they're a very important educational tool in a child's development. What do I mean by that? When a child plays a board game, they learn how to take turns. They learn how to follow rules. They learn how to be a good sport, right? To uh, not get upset when they lose and to not be obnoxious if they win. So there are all these um, lessons that come with playing a game. But furthermore, this game was made by Oswald so that the children could learn about the ghetto that they found themselves in. And you see here, that's the names of all the buildings. Um, so they would know where to go. It's where they got their food. It's, it's, it's all these things. And even there's a chance card. When you get the, one of the chance cards, it says your name is on the list of transports for tomorrow. So really, it was meant to let them know what could happen in the ghetto. Okay, so the education of the children becomes a very strong focus in Theresienstadt. And all of the education of the children is illegal. They're doing that all underground. So when we're talking about children, that's what we're doing here in Theresienstadt. The next artifact, oops, sorry, the next artifact I want to show you is um, this doll over here. Okay. And you'll see this doll over here. What do we notice about the doll? The first thing we see is that the head is broken. So what's the story behind this doll? How does it get the broken head? And to do that, I will click on the image and you can see this woman here. You can see, oops, sorry, you can see that she survived. Her name was Vera Bader. And you see her in the picture over here with her brother. That's her older brother, Yuri, who unfortunately did not survive the Holocaust. We'll explain in a minute what happened, but he, she does tell us the story of how the doll got the broken head. What happened? Uh, they were moving into, they, they got the orders to move from their hometown in Czechoslovakia and they're being moved to the ghettos. And the Jews are told they can carry 50 kilograms if they can even carry that much with them. And that's it. Yuri's about to be turned 13. So in his parents' eyes, he's already becoming what we would call a big boy. So they make him carry a lot of stuff. And Vera, the only toy she takes with her is her beloved doll. And pretty much she's carrying just her doll and maybe one or two other things. When the Jews get to Theresienstadt, they have to walk about a mile and a half from the train there that, they're, that they come from to the entrance of Theresienstadt. And this is January. In January is when the Bader family arrives at Theresa said, and we can imagine it's cold, it's a long walk. And Yuri has to carry all of this stuff his parents gave him and Vera is not carrying very much. And what happens is Vera tells us that Yuri gets upset, right? He loses his patience and he gets upset and he eventually it leads to him taking the doll and throwing it on the ground. And that's how the doll gets the broken head. Now, why do I share that seemingly insignificant story? Because I really think there's a lot that we can learn. First of all, we see the story of children. We see how the children, no matter what happens to children, children many times will just be ordinary children. What was happening to them was so out of the, out of the ordinary, but um, we see that they behaved like regular children. And it's also a story of the parents. And what do I mean by that? Here we have parents that we can we know if they're being taken to the, the ghetto they've already they lost their jobs they've been banished from their homes and their community that the community that, that they know they're being taken to a place they have no idea where they're being taken to and in fact they have no idea what's going to happen to them in the next hour and then what do they also have to deal with they have to deal with their children fighting now i imagine there are a lot of parents out there today listening in. I'm a parent myself, even on a good day when children 
argue. Um, it's very difficult for us as parents. We can only imagine the experience of parents in this whole story when we talk about the children. So I wanted to share that with you. And now I want to move to the um, very special boy over here that I want to introduce you to. His name is Peter Gens. I'm going to zero in on him over here a little bit. We'll see a picture of him in just a minute. When I talk about Peter Gens, I don't even know where to begin to tell you how talented he was. He had so many talents. You can see here his artwork, and he shows us very clearly these big buildings that they lived in in Theresienstadt. He um, loved science, and he was also a writer. Look over here. Okay, I want to show you something. He was a writer. What happened is when the Jews were living, uh, excuse me, when the children were living in these homes of theirs, they did form the camaraderie that the Jewish council was hoping they would. And many of these homes, the children themselves produced publications. They had magazines. It was, it was fun for them to do that. We learn a lot about the children in Theresienstadt from the magazines that we see. So I wanna show you a page from one of the magazines here. Um, it was called, here I'm gonna jump out for a minute to my power, to my presentation here. It was called, you see in the corner over here, it was called Comrade. Comrade in Czech actually means what it sounds like in English, comrade, it means friend. And that's what they named their paper that they produced. Now, I think there were 22 issues of this that we have that survived. And we have here, what I brought to you is the fun corner, right? They have a quiz that they put in. And first of all, I think it's very fascinating to see what they thought their friends should know. List 10 rivers in North America, list five well-known operas and their composers. Okay, very interesting. But look what we have here. Look what they write about giving your answers in when you do the quiz. Answer honestly without using an atlas. Okay, I'm gonna say it again. Answer honestly without using an atlas. These are children whose lives are anything but fair. Their worlds have been torn apart, but what are they demanding from each other? They're demanding honesty. They're demanding morality. They're demanding that they be fair. Okay, so I just thought that was a beautiful uh, message that I wanted to share with you. And now we will go back to Peter Gens. Peter, we, I also have to mention, he was sent to Theresienstadt alone at the age of 14. Um, and it's a long story why, but, but he was. And he became the editor and contributor to the children's magazine that was in his home. And the magazine was called Vedem. You can see that right here. Vedem, translated from Czech, means we will lead. And I want to show you one of the covers that he drew for Vedem. Okay, look what he drew. It's clearly a battle scene, so to speak. We have a cannon, we have cannonballs, but look what the cannon is made out of. You see this here? It's made out of paper, but what's written on the top of the paper, Vedem. So what's he telling everybody? What's he trying to express? That we're gonna fight back, but what are we gonna fight back with? Our words. And I'm gonna explain these words to you over here in the cannonballs. What does he say they're gonna use? It says satire, mirth, and wit. And that's what we're gonna to use to fight back, okay? So um, you see really how, how wise he was, how talented, and there's one more story with P Peter that I have to share with you. And I want you to see this sketch that he does. Um, it's relatively famous, maybe you've seen it before, but if you haven't, I'm happy to tell you about it right now. It's called the moon landscape. And what it is, you see the earth in the background, so it's Peter's idea of what he thinks it would be like to be on the moon, looking out over onto the earth. Okay, now I have to bring somebody else into the story. And some of you may recognize this man. His name is Elon Ramon. Now, you can tell by the picture, if you don't know who he is, that he was an astronaut. But you can also tell that from his Israeli flag that he was Israeli. Elon Ramon is very much a national hero here in Israel. And he's a national hero first because one of the reasons is because he went up into space with NASA. Now, unfortunately for us, he did go in 2003 on the Columbia shuttle. And I'm sure uh, most of you understand what I say when I say that, why it was tragic because the Columbia shuttle at the end of its mission, it fulfilled its mission, but when it was re-entering the earth, there was a problem and uh, it exploded and all the astronauts were killed. So 
But in spite of this tragic ending, I do want to share with you um, P, uh, Elon, something that happened on the mission. And when astronauts apparently go to space, they take things with them. So Elon Ramon's mother and grandmother survived Auschwitz. And so when he was going out into space, he wanted to take something that would be meaningful towards that. And so what did he take with him? He took a copy of Peter's moon landscape. And why did he take it? Because as a tribute as a way of commemorating Peter Ginn's, he was going to fulfill Peter's dream of seeing the earth from space. And he did get to do that. But I also have to add, I wanna take it one step further. I mean, it's a, such a meaningful story and a beautiful way for um, a victim of the Holocaust to be commemorated. But there's something else I wanna share with you before we leave this area. And that is that Ilan Ramon was a hero in Israel well before he went out up into space. Why is that? Because when he was younger and he was doing his army service here in Israel, he was a part of the Air Force. He was a fighter pilot in the Air Force. And in 1981, he was chosen to be a part of the mission that was going from Israel to destroy the nuclear reactor in Iraq. And there were eight planes going. And Ilan Ramon was the youngest pilot and he was the one who wasn't married. So that meant that he was assigned the most dangerous position um, of the airplanes and he was the last airplane. And he took that risk, he took that danger and he went with the mission and thank God they all came back. Um, and he did prevent one of Israel's enemies from getting the ability to have nuclear weapons. And so really he truly um, was a hero. Now, why do I mention all of that? Because when we talk about Elon Ramon, in spite of his tragic death, he represents to us potential that is realized, right? He's, he's, he's a hero. And not only that, he fulfills probably every young boy's dream of going out into space. He's potential realized. And when we take a look at Peter Gans, and I, I, I mentioned briefly how talented he was in all sorts of different areas, Unfortunately, Peter to us is potential that's lost. We can only imagine what he would have contributed to the world had he not been taken away to Auschwitz and killed at the age of 16. Okay, so for us, um, we, we remember Peter, but we also were, are reminded of what we lost, especially when the children were taken from us. And with that in mind now, what we're going to do is we're gonna go, we're coming really, our time is, is, um, moving along. And so now I'm taking you out of the museum and I'm taking to you very special place we have on our campus here at Yad Vashem. It's the Children's Memorial, which is dedicated to the one and a half million children that we guesstimate were killed in the Holocaust. So we're gonna take a look at it in a minute, but before we do that, I just wanna take a look at one thing over here. Because if we are telling the story of the Holocaust, I think it's important to include them in this one. We can see it very clearly. See how we have these trees. And next to the trees, we have plaques. At Yad Vashem, when we have a tree with a plaque next to it, it has a, the plaque has a name, it has a country where that person's from. These are people that Yad Vashem has bestowed upon them the honor of a righteous among the nations. And who were those people? The righteous among the nations were the non-Jews that risked their lives, sometimes gave their lives. They risked their lives to save Jews during the Holocaust. We use a tree as a symbol uh, for those people. And there's many reasons, many beautiful reasons why we can say we use a tree, but I, I'll bring just one of them here uh, today. And that is because when we think of a tree, uh, we think of the roots and then we think of all the branches and leaves and everything that grows from the tree. And when we, 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 we have a saying in Judaism, we say, or we have a tradition that we believe that if you save a life, you save an entire world. And so everybody who was a non-Jew and saved a Jew during the Holocaust, we don't look at it as I mean, we look at it as like they saved that Jew, but they saved the whole world then that would come from that person. Okay, so it's really, I think, a beautiful symbol for somebody that saved a life. And I just wanted to point it out to you while we're here because they are a very important part of the story. Now we're going to go back to the Children's Memorial itself. And this entire area is a part of the memorial. So before we actually enter the memorial, I want to go over here. 
I want to take a look at this structure that we see. I'm going to zero in on it. This is a part of the memorial. And notice what we have here. We have pillars, and those stone pillars are cut short. They're broken. And so we're talking about children who were killed in the Holocaust. We're talking about lives that were cut short. We see that very clearly here. But I also want to discuss with you how they're arranged. Look at the arrangement we have these pillars in. We have the shortest in the front. We have the tallest in the back. And what do we think of when we think of the shortest in the front and the tallest in the back? Right? We think of class photos. We think of children in class photos. We think of choir performances. We think of youth group pictures and sports clubs, but in the photographs from, from sports clubs. And so what we have here is the tragic image of children that should be lined up for something like that. And instead, all we have are the pillars. And now we're about to enter the memorial itself. And I want you to take a look up here because we have something else here. We have the rebar sticking up, right? We have that sticking up. And it seems to us as though the memorial itself is unfinished. Well, it's been here since 1987. So What's that rebar doing there? We leave the memorial itself permanently unfinished, again, to symbolize the lives of the children that were unfinished because of the Holocaust. And now we're gonna enter the memorial. Notice we're walking down the entire, first of all, it was designed again by Moshe Safdi, right? The same architect that did the museum. Notice we are walking down. Everything in the memorial itself was built underground very much in a way like a symbolic grave for all of these children who were killed, but we don't know where their graves are. Now I point out this um, image to you of this little young boy, his name is Uziel, and that'll help us understand how we got this memorial. There was a couple by the name of Abe and Adita Spiegel. They arrived at Auschwitz with their young son Uziel and Adita's mother, the grandmother, and of course we know young children and elderly people were taken away right away to be killed. And that's unfortunately what happened with Uziel and his grandmother. But Edita and Abraham are chosen to work and they both end up surviving and they find each other after the war and they, they move eventually to California and they do uh, go on to have other children. But of course they never get over the loss of their precious son Uziel. And so they, may, they help Yad Vashem build this memorial in memory of Uziel, but also uh, in memory of all the children that were killed in the Holocaust. And now I'm gonna bring you into the memorial itself. And the first thing we see are these photographs. Okay, there's only nine photographs here, but look how we use mirrors to make it look like a lot more children than that. And then we're gonna go into the memorial. Now, what I'm gonna do with you, because the memorial in there, it's very important to also hear the memorial. So I'm gonna play for you a video of what you hear when you go in. And then we'll go into the memorial and talk, talk about it afterwards. So here's the video. And you know what? I'm gonna ask you to do the same thing because you're because you're my visitors today, Yad Vashem. What you're gonna hear is you're gonna hear them reading names to you of children who were killed in the Holocaust. If you can, try and remember one of the names. Just keep one of the names in your in your head. Okay, so let's go to that video. Emanuel Diakovetsky, five years old, Ukraine. Paula Kolin, 12 years old, Poland. Hanna Rivka Yosefovich, five years old, Hungary. Jeanette Alman, six years old, France. Svetlana Mishlimovich, three years old, Russia. Okay. Um, and I wanted you, oops, I meant, I just want to go here for a minute. I want to leave you with this image here that we see of all the lights and the darkness because when we go into the memorial, we hear those names, we hear that music, and it's very dark when we go in and we see all these little lights. Now we're gonna go back to our tour and you'll see it's a little different because when they were uh, making these virtual tours, of course they had to use flash photography. 
So it's not quite as dark as it is. Usually I tell people they have to even hold on to these handrails to get through because it is so dark like you saw before. But what we do see here that we couldn't see in the video is we see how we're surrounded by all these lights and just so you know, there's only five candles that are lit. There's five candles that are lit and these mirrors are used. So first of all, we're surrounded by the memorial, but also if you look, the lights basically, they go into infinity. We cannot count how many lights we have here. And that's significant. We're gonna talk about it, right? As we leave the memorial, okay? We're gonna walk out. Now, first of all, if you remembered a name, and even if you didn't, if you just heard the names, what we just did is we, were more, we memorialized children who were killed in the Holocaust. And unfortunately, all we can do for these children now is remember that they ever even existed. And when it comes to children, we're especially afraid that children will be forgotten even more so than adults. And why is that? Because most children, or we saw a few that really did leave some things behind, but most children don't leave things behind. They don't sign documents that we find. They don't leave things like that. And so the likelihood is that they'll be forgotten. So we come to Yad Vashem and we specifically remember the children. Now, I hope that you could see through the video and also when we went into the memorial itself, that they very much use the imagery of stars, right? When it was dark, it looked like a night sky with stars. And even in the memorial with the light, you could see that the lights went into infinity, much like stars, which of course we can't touch them, but we also, we can't count them. And I wanna discuss this, why they possibly use this imagery of stars to talk about and to memorialize the children who were killed in the Holocaust. And I wanna share with you my thoughts that when it comes to the children who were killed in the Holocaust, the world can't quantify what we lost when these children were killed. And why is that? It's just like we said with Peter Gans, we have no idea what their potential um, was. We have no idea what these children were supposed to grow up and accomplish, what they were supposed to do. How do we know? Maybe one of these children was meant to be the next Albert Einstein. Maybe one of these children, he or she was going to invent the cure for cancer and we live in a cancer-free world, but we don't because they were killed before they had a chance to do that. Now, obviously I made that up, but the uh, the idea is that the possibilities, th the potential of what could have been, we can't quantify that. The, 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 the options are endless. And in fact, um, of course, nobody says anything better than Elie Wiesel. So I'm going to share with you that Elie Wiesel, at one point, he does an interview with Oprah. And you can go on YouTube and you can find the interview he does with Oprah. And you know what he tells Oprah? He says, with everything that happened to him all throughout the Holocaust. The only thing that literally brings him to tears and makes him cry is now many things about his parents, even though of course he loved them so much and, it's, and he spent all that time with his father and Auschwitz and it's not his older sisters, it's his little sister who was seven years old when he saw her walk away at Auschwitz. And why does that make him cry? Because he says, I can't help but think of the writer she could have been, of the musician she could have been, of the philosopher, of the mother, of the friend. And that's what makes him cry. So really, when we think of children, uh, we can't help but think of the tremendous loss that we have from them. But we're reaching the end of our tour here now. And uh, we always like to end on a more hopeful note. And so with that in mind, I couldn't help but think of turning to the children themselves. We spent a lot of time talking about young adults and children today in our effort to give over the, the human story of the Holocaust. And I wanna share with you the words from that um, one of the um, magazines that we saw already, the comrade, and listen what the children themselves write. They say, we remember a year has already gone by since many of our friends from the Hanover barrack were forced to leave. Perhaps you remember the boys who would still be among us if it weren't for fate that carried them off far away from us. A whole year has already passed since they left the home and disappeared from our sight, but they will never disappear from our hearts. Never. So I want to 
first of all, thank everybody for coming here today and helping us in our goal of always keeping these children and all of the Jews in our hearts, always remembering them. That's what we try to do here every day at Yad Vashem. Okay. But I also want to share with you one final thought before we leave. And that's very important, even just remembering. So again, thank you for coming. But take a look at the exit. We're looking back over now the exit of the Children's Museum, uh, excuse me, the Children's Memorial. And you notice this is the exit, but look what we have all around it. We have all the greenery, we see the sky, right? And we see the trees. And so the Children's Memorial, it actually can be overwhelming. Um, but we don't want you to leave with that feeling. And we take a look over here, we think of um, nature and we think of things growing in nature. We think of spring and rebirth and um, things like that, but also look at the trees. And we discussed briefly how the trees in particular Yad Vashem, what do they represent? They represent that little spark of light in all that darkness, right? The people who, who, who had the courage to do good um, with all that evil that was taking place. With that in mind, we're gonna end with the words of a 13 year old girl who found herself, was the area that's now the Ukraine. She found herself alone. She was 12 when she found herself all alone with no family. And she finally ended up uh, at the house of a woman and her name was Olina Hiroshin, and she is one of our Righteous Among the Nations. Now, Olina Hiroshin lived with her brother, and her brother, even though she wanted to hide uh, this girl, D Donia, she wanted to hide her in her house, her brother wouldn't let her. So Olina takes her to the forest, and she digs her a hole. And Donia, at the age of 13, goes into this hole, and that's where she is for at least two winters in that hole. And Olina brings her food every day. And listen to what Donia writes to us, Donia Rosen. And at this point, she really doesn't think she's going to survive. But what does she write? She writes, words fail me, but I must write, I must. I ask you not to forget the deceased. I ask you to build a memorial in her names, a monument reaching up to the heavens that the entire world might see. Not a monument of marble or stone, but one of good deeds. For I believe with full and perfect faith that only such a monument can promise you and your children a better future. She's 13 years old when she writes this. So I will leave you with this thought that we did build the monuments of marble or, and of stone, right? We saw that today, but maybe we can look at it as just a tool, a tool so that we can fulfill the, uh, the mission that Donia has given to us. And what has Donia told us? She said, she looks around and sees all the evil, but she doesn't want her world to be defined by that. She wants a world that's defined by goodness. So maybe we can leave to, uh, our, our tour today at Yad Vashem with those thoughts. And instead of being overwhelmed by the loss that we have, we can be inspired by the few of the victims we were able to see today, how they lived their life during the Holocaust, uh, the messages that they gave over to us and take that with us and hopefully make this world that we live in help Donia with her mission to make sure it's a world filled with goodness. And so with that, I, we end our tour here at Yad Vashem. I hope that it was meaningful, you, meaningful for you. I thank you all for coming. 